My name is Teresa Grella Hillebrand, and I am uh, the director of the Counseling and Mental Health Professions Program, uh, not program, clinic, um, which serves the Counseling and Mental Health Professions programs, graduate programs at Hofstra University. Um, and in the clinic at the Salzman Center at Hofstra, what I do is basically um, supervise administratively and sometimes clinically uh, graduate students who are doing their clinical work in the Salzman Center, which means that the students that are under the umbrella of counseling and mental health professions are in either mental health counseling programs, uh, marriage and family therapy program, rehabilitation counseling program, and creative arts therapy program. So we have students from any one of those four programs that come in to do their clinical practicum, sometimes their internships with us. And that means they're applying the theory they learn in the classroom to working with um, clients from the community. And we um, see clients from Long Island, Queens, um, Suffolk County, Nassau County, uh, and really serve a wide range of needs in our clinic. Um, and there are several other clinics within the Salzman Center, and we can talk about those. Joe will talk a little more about uh, the psychology clinic. And as well as doing that, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and have been for about 25 years now. So I'm in private practice as well. And uh, some of the topics that we're talking about are things that I'm talking about with uh, families that I'm working with privately, with families that the students are working with, and in my own family. I have um, several children uh, who are, uh, have been affected by COVID and um, have had to sort of suspend their lives to a degree like the rest of us and are coping with that uh, themselves. So there's a bit of uh, personal and professional overlap, which is always the case. And we'll talk a, a lot more about those things and about what um, we're seeing with our clients. And hopefully, Joe and I were saying before we got started today, we're really hoping that people who have questions will put them in the chat. And then, you know, part of our presentation is sort of a little bit of psychoeducation. And um, we're hoping that a good part of it will be conversational and collaborative because we're both really collaborative thinkers and um, really feed off of other people's energy and participation. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Joe to introduce himself. Okay, hello, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Joe Scardafane. I'm the uh, executive director and uh, of the Joan and Arnold Salzman Community Services Center. I'm also the director of the psychology training clinic. Um, and that serves two doctoral programs, one in clinical psychology, one in school psychology. Uh, and our, we exist as a center to train students at the master's and doctoral level. Um, we have other clinics there, including a literacy clinic, um, speech language hearing clinic, which includes audiology, uh, Teresa's clinic, counseling and mental health professions, my clinic, psychological evaluation, research and counseling clinic. And then we also have the Diane Linda Goldberg Child Care Institute which is a um, child care, really early education um, institute for children from eight weeks of age to five years of age. So we go up to pre-K. So we have infants through about five years of age. So we're a busy, very, very busy center. And now we are a very busy center uh, remotely. And we are hoping to gradually open up as the state guidelines dictate, and as the university um, <clears throat> open up for face-to-face. -face. Um, the thing that's interesting for both Teresa and I is that we had to move our clinics completely remotely. And somebody who uh, has been doing this a long time, like myself, uh, didn't think that I would have to be involved in telehealth in my career. But I certainly... Um, I am a new fan and uh, with the support of our uh, information technology um, department, um, we were able to make the transition. I'm very grateful for them. And grateful that all of you are here and that we have this opportunity to share some of what um, our experience has been. Uh, you could probably guess that we don't have data on anything uh, right now related to what necessarily helps in this pandemic with COVID-19. Um, we, we are basing the information that we have on previous data, what happened in 
either other pandemics or um, what went on in terms of national emergencies, changes in lifestyles, things along those lines. So, so that's what was really culled together um, in part for this presentation. So um, thank you all for being here. And Teresa and I will just kind of go back and forth and have a conversation here. And um, <clears throat> please put any questions or comments in the chat. Um, we're happy to um, actually answer them as we go along. Because I think that's normally, you know, if we were to do this, we'd be in a larger room and we would really enjoy a conversation. So again, I do want to uh, echo Teresa's thoughts and um, give her, um, you know, give the uh, agreement that we really would like to have a conversation here. The last thing I'll say is that we come to this from different perspectives. Teresa is a uh, licensed marriage and family therapist and that's a field that is very uh, focused on systems and the way the family functions as a system, which is a really important aspect of what we're going to talk about. I'm a clinical psychologist. I come to this more from an individual mental health perspective, and there really is room for both in this discussion. Obviously, there's always something missing somewhere. Um, so, um, you know, we'll just know that. And obviously, we're not going to touch on, on everything that needs to be discussed. The, these are bullet points, what we think is important. We've highlighted those kinds of things and we'll just kind of take it from there. Okay. Okay. So let me see if I can be the technical person and work the slides. Ah, here we go. So the first thing we have is just a definition of resiliency that we thought we wanted to um, share with everyone just to have a kind of an umbrella to work under. Um, I don't know that we need to read the slide other than um, to talk about how it has to do with adaptation when, you know, people are facing adversity and trauma and tragedy. And um, I know we're talking, the talk is about COVID and about how families can build resiliency. Uh, it's very difficult for me to have this conversation and not talk a little bit or think uh, a little bit about community, given what's going on in the world as well, and the resiliency that's needed uh, to deal with some of the stress and trauma that we as a, as a country are uh, in the midst of now related to COVID and also um, some of the issues of regarding racial justice. Um, so we want to talk about first acknowledging some things around trauma and around pain, um, and then move into a discussion about, about how to really talk more about that with our, our families and our loved ones. Um, I want to say that some of the most resilient people that um, I know in this moment, Joe referenced how we had to move from being an in-person live center where people came into our waiting room like any other clinic or doctor's office and, and our students uh, who were interning met with clients in a physical space together. And it, in the matter of, you know, overnight, basically, we had to stop going to the center and we had to figure out how to get online. And the graduate students in all of the programs that Joe and I are working with, and really across the board at the Salzman Center who are doing clinical work, have really taught us about resiliency in some ways too. They have adapted to this new format. They've figured out how to do um, therapy from, you know, using Zoom or another um, HIPAA compliant platform. And they're new to the world of therapy and being in a room with clients. And so to have that additional challenge to not only be able, you know, not only to be starting your professional work, you know, face to face with people, but then have to shift to this remote platform and continue in such a passionate and devoted way has been really, I think, inspirational for both of us. So I did want to just kind of give a shout out to some of the people that have actually um, really, I think, become our teachers, even though they're our students. Yeah, that's true. I think that's, and so one of the things that we need to look at is we need to look at resilience in the world around us as well. And, and one of the aspects of that um, has to do with what's called post-traumatic growth, 
uh, we, you know, we have post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and we've often focused on that. Um, with, with loss and with some kinds of trauma, and particularly trauma in terms of uh, the trauma of everyday life in some ways, um, people actually can grow and change their lives for the better when they actually respond to these different kinds of challenges. So, so that's why the slide at the end says that it can also involve profound personal growth. We're gonna speak about both uh, the whole continuum of the process. And so um, when, and we'll start with this, increasing your self-awareness. So, so one of the contexts that we have here is that for parents, as we're, we're figuring that most of the people in the audience are parents and they wanna know about how to keep families together. And if you're not a parent or you have a partner, or if you live alone and you're in this community in some way, all of these things can be adapted uh, to uh, your life as it is. And so, I mean, we- Yeah, I think, it, I'm yep. sorry to jump sure. in. I just, I think it can be adapted to any relationship. If you're a person and you have a human connection with other people, there are going to be people who are going through tough times because of what we're living with right now. So even if it's not about, you know, your, your personal conversation might not be with an adolescent, it might be with a dear friend who's struggling with, with loss in some way or, or disappointment. So really this is broad and, and can be applied in almost any relationship, really all relationships. Yeah, that's a great point. So, <clears throat> So one of the things, so when we say parents here again, let's just keep in mind that what we're really talking about here is those of us in any relationship here. So the first piece of this is checking in with yourself. And it's uh, sometimes if we're not used to this, this can be a, a difficult experience because it actually means slowing down, taking a breath, Letting yourself actually be in a separate space on your own in whatever dwelling you're in and just be with what comes up. Now, many of you, we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness. Many of you have probably heard about mindfulness meditation. This does not have to be a formal meditation in any way. There's actually just very powerful things that happen when we get to know ourselves by slowing our bodies down and sitting and just feeling sensations and being aware of emotions and thoughts that come up. So <clears throat> the reason why self-awareness is important is because we're not going to be able to really be helpful to others if we're not aware of our own experience in this same context, and in this case, it's in this pandemic with being uh, shut down in some way and not going back to um, other things that, um, that we're used to on a daily basis. So I see that um, Afia raised her hand. Would you, would you have a question, Afia? You could, you want, you, you could, uh, maybe I, I need to unmute you. Okay. Okay, I can't unmute you. Oop. Let's see, I did for a second. Or maybe you can unmute. Can you unmute Hello? Hi. Oh, great, I'm audible. I have a question about uh, this idea about being in a separate space, how mm. this is managed with a young child. Um, because in a, in a small apartment, frankly, because there is a need and a desire for closeness. Yes. Um, but also a need and desire for space <laughs> that is not easily understood or possible in some cases with a youngster. So I wanted to see if you could speak about that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Uh, go ahead, Teresa. I, th I think there are a lot of challenges when it comes to young children who can't quite understand cognitively, you know, when, we, when mommy needs a little time or a break. Um, and we can actually create some routines and structure that help allow for some separateness. So um, if the child is beyond an age where they, they nap anymore and that's not an option, I mean, that that's an ideal option for parents with really young kids who might 
nap during the day. If you could, if you're working from home and you have a child you're raising and you can take a break your lunch hour when they're napping, that's ideal. Um, if you don't have a situation where that's the case, you might save some special activities that your child really enjoys for a time when you would take some space for yourself and explain it to them de developmentally, depending how old they are in an age appropriate way, some in a way they could understand that mom needs a little bit of time and mom's going to have some special time to do something that really mom wants to do. And you can have some special time and I've saved this thing for you. When my kids were little, um, one of the things that I could not live without, and I had several around my home, were kitchen timers, the ones that you could literally wind to 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour. And that's how I would help them mark time if I needed a little time for myself, that we were going to set the timer, and they couldn't understand how many minutes, but they would know that when it rang, you know, that would be it. Um, and then we'd come back together. So there are ways to be creative if it's a small space and um, you have a bedroom that one person can go in, that would be great. Um, if not, if you actually are in one central living space, then it, I'm sorry, I'm getting a call coming in on my phone that I don't know how to stop. This is what I mean about technology being, it's just ringing in my ear, I'm hoping you can't hear it. Um, but there we go. No, nope, still going. The sense, you know, that I have is it's challenging. I don't want to pretend that this is going to be easy to do with a child, but for all of us, um, I think one of the things we do is we kind of train each other. So in the um, beginning, if you haven't taken time for yourself and this is a new concept for your child, it's going to take a little while uh, before they can kind of accommodate that need, even if you are providing them with something they want to do, you know, the interruptions, the back and forth. I would say start with a little bit of time, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, and build up to that um, uh, more time for yourself. And then for some parents, it might be that you're going to get up a little earlier in the morning than you normally would um, so that you make that time for yourself or at the end of the day, if that's a better time for you, staying up a little while after your child goes to sleep. I think the crucial thing is creating space for yourself and however you do that, and that might vary from day to day. One day your kid might be really agreeable to giving you space and having fun with their thing and other days it might not fly. So we have to be flexible with ourselves and be willing to change our routines a little bit as needed because this is important. And I think one of the things that um, we don't really value as a society at all is slowing down and being quiet and taking time to check in with ourselves. So for us even, we're gonna have our own resistance. I don't know if you want to answer. I'm just that aware too. of time. I'm just mm -hmm. aware of time, Therese. Go ahead. So, um, um, uh, there's another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. I just want to um, mention. So, so I hope that the answers we give can just be some food for thought. I know that there are very logist, you know, there are logistical issues that might just be difficult to come around. But that question was a, is a question that parents of young kids often ask, and. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. A lot of the things we're going to recommend here may be aspirational for you, depending on your circumstances. And for others, it, you know, they just may be more doable now. So um, people are reading uh, here. We're saying, be aware of your own emotions and thoughts. Allow the experience of your emotions and thoughts. Allow the experience of them. Recognize there are multiple experiences. So the question that um, we have here, <clears throat> when you let yourself feel your emotions more fully, what do you think people should do when their emotions start causing those around them to start feeling upset? So I would say that there are a couple of things here. You feeling your emotion doesn't necessarily mean you're sharing it, okay? Unless the feeling of, of your emotion. So what we're talking about here is allowing yourself to feel your emotion, to be aware of your emotion. And um, you can't necessarily uh, control the uh, effect on other people. So <clears throat> what we would say compared to you, like if you're a parent, 
you do want to allow yourself to feel your emotions. Um, and we also want to feel them and experience them so that we can be together ourselves in some way when we're with our kids too. Now that doesn't mean you have to be a superhero. And um, it does mean that you need to know that you may be upset at times and that adults do cry. I mean, I've, I've talked to um, a lot of uh, parents who have said that they've cried in front of their kids because of the things that they see that they you know, might be uh, losing and so on. And I think just being honest about that is okay. I guess, um, you know, I would ask the questioner, um, uh, uh, what, what kind of upsetment are you talking about? Because there's going to be upsetment. And I think you want to be careful about shutting that down. Like if people voice their fears and they're upset about things, that's actually in a really nice opportunity for the family to share that. So I guess, is there something more specific um, in the question that you're asking? I mean, you know, the, the rule of thumb here is don't be afraid of emotion. And yeah, I think yeah, in, our, in our work with parents, uh, that's a big fear parents have. What if my child sees me crying or frustrated and um, I don't want them to, be upset or, or sometimes kids' instincts are to come to you and sort of comfort you or acknowledge it in a way that we may not be comfortable with, like having our child point out to us that we're upset or having a teenager sit, give us feedback about us and our emotions. Um, I think though, I, not just I think, I really believe and have seen that this is actually can be a, a launching point for really crucial conversations between parents and kids about emotions, about just the pain that we all experience uh, related to disappointment, sadness, losses, um, not wanting to, uh, to dismiss that, although the urge for parents is often, especially if it's our child who's in distress, to clean it up to make them feel better, to reassure them. Um, and I think what Joe's, Joe's point about checking in with you and knowing where you're at and being able to tolerate your own emotional distress, the feelings that we all don't love when they come visit us, you know, the, the less, not the happy feelings, but the other feelings. I think if you're having trouble acknowledging that and sitting with that yourself, it's gonna be that much harder when your kid comes to you with those feelings, right? I don't want to feel that. I don't want them to feel that. And then there's sort of like a, a message given around emotion, the limits of emotional expression in a family. And this is a time when actually we do need to expand emotional expression in a healthy way and not limit it. Do you want to add to that, Joe? No, I, th I think I think that's uh, we touched on important issues like that. Again, if, if the questioner has anything, any more thing more specific, we'd be happy to answer. I think the last point on this slide is important too. Um, identifying personal supports that you can utilize to process your feelings because the challenges, especially if we're all kind of locked in and locked down together for the most part, that you may have a lot of your own feelings. You may have a lot of your own stressors and it can be um, tempting sometimes, especially when kids are a little older, to lean on them a little bit or process with them as a parent. And um, so while it can say, it seem like I'm saying conflicting things because I'm saying be open. And uh, now I'm also saying potentially um, really think about what you're sharing with your child and what you need to share with some other supportive people in your life, the other adults, the people you turn to, because we do need to talk about what's going on. And some of that is appropriate to share with our kids and some of it isn't. So for us, we need to have all our supports in place so that we can support our children in the way we hope to through these kinds of challenges. Great. Is there another question, Joe, or no? No. Nope. No. Okay. So uh, good. The question is that thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. So we're going to move on to compassion. Um, and we've got a definition here as a process or state of being that connects to a person's overall suffering or struggle and provides the impetus to help the person find relief from his or her suffering. So 
you wanted to talk a little bit about compassion? Jim? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> can you just go back to the sure. slide there? Thanks. So, so <clears throat> the reason why we bring compassion into this is that it's crucial in these kinds of cases um, to have compassion not only for others, but for yourself as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But the whole idea here is that everyone in this situation needs help. There's, there's, the, um, there's the idea that um, always remember whoever you're with, they're going through something. Now, one of the unique things about this situation is that we know one of the things we're going through is a pandemic. And that's something that, and we're all going through it. And the question is, how is that having an impact on them? And I really want to individualize that. Um, I have two sons. One of them is very social and the other one tends to be more technologically oriented, has a smaller circle of friends. He seems much less affected by the pandemic and the shutdowns um, because that's just something he's, um, not that he's used to it, but there's, there's less of a need to get out in the world and always be with people. And my other son is very, very social, human contact, lots of conversation. And this is, he's struggling with this. Um, and, and, the, and I think those are just two examples. And there's a whole really um, spectrum of, of different needs that we have in terms of contact, in terms of our professions, there, there's a lot of role loss in this as well. There's role loss for students sitting in the third row in the fourth seat. Um, you know, that's who they were, that's where they were. Now all of a sudden they're home. It's not just role loss for jobs, but it's role loss then also for how I'm doing my job and so on. So we need to have a lot of compassion in terms of connecting to other people. And that's very, very important because it really then does help us to look to help others to find some relief in some way. Teresa, can you go to the next one? Sure. Okay. So if we look at compassion, compassion ultimately is the heart of understanding. And what's really important about this, this is actually a Buddhist concept of what compassion is. Um, and it really has to do with to see that all events, including human behavior, have causes that you couldn't possibly be any different than you are in this moment at this time, based on your whole history that brought you to right now. And I think what's important here um, is, is something that, uh, the idea that then leads to the next things is that even in their imperfection, things are perfect as they are. Meaning that we are at a state in time that many of us are struggling, some of us are struggling more than others. And perfect as they are doesn't mean that it's good. It just means that it couldn't be any other way. It's a different kind of a conception of perfection, which leads to the last statement here, which is that people are doing the best that they can. That every one of us right now, in this moment, we're doing the best we can to function, to have relationships, to do our jobs in this context. And it's just a very, very important thing that really breeds compassion, but you need to turn this on yourself first. If you don't turn this on yourself first, you're gonna have a harder time being compassionate with others. Yes, I think a lot of you know parents who are really loving parents and want the best for their children, um, our intentions are, you know, good. And we, we expect a lot of ourselves in any situation. And so this piece about self-compassion and being kind to yourself and realizing that in this context, what's going on, you know, we are, you are doing the best you can. It may not be the, what you wish, but it's what is. Um, and to be kind to yourself about all of the limitations and challenges that you're facing um, it, at this particular moment, and always, but we're talking about, you know, a specific problem that we're all facing. Um, and it can be hard to look at our children, particularly adolescents who tend to be 
you know, less verbally expressive at times in, in ways that are, you know, positive, they may complain, um, who may be seeming to be, you know, struggling and, and um, giving you attitude. It's hard to look at them and see them as doing the best they can. And if you can hold this thought in mind and really believe that, you know, in that any given moment, we're all doing the best that we can. Could we do better? Yeah. But in this moment, if this is what's how we're showing up, then it's the best we can do. And we will have compassion around that if it's less than we hope for. So there are a couple of, thank you, that's fair. There are a couple of questions in the chat. One of them um, says, being a grandparent has presented a huge range of emotions, but my biggest concern has to do with my two-year-old granddaughter. We saw her in person for the first time in three months and it was over a fence in the backyard. And as we sang a song together, she began to sob and we were not able to comfort her. It was traumatic for her and for us. How do I help her? Hmm. Wow. Just How beautiful, he really. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Just hearing that, you know, touches me. Um, I would say presence is comforting. The fact that you would be there that way if you could stay with her, I'm assuming a parent was with her maybe and comforting her. Um, and just acknowledge, put some words to it. This is really hard. We miss you. Um, we see you miss us. And then stay connected as much as you can. The screens, they are limiting and they're also um, an amazing gift that we have. So if that child, if you can't see that child in person, from a distance more regularly, keeping in contact, whether it's um, recording on your phone, uh, a favorite like child song that you love, singing it with your, you know, the other grandparent or on your own, reading a story through Zoom or FaceTime at night, you could record yourself reading a story and then the parents could have the book um, there and grandpa or grandma could be reading as the parents turning the pages. Ways to maintain connection from a distance while challenging do exist for us in ways that they might not have before. So we can't have the contact um, physically that we want, but we can show up in different ways for um, our grandchildren or um, people that we love and miss. And in terms of comforting, I guess I want to also go back to um, teaching children about emotions. So when they're crying, helping that two-year-old child name it, are you feeling sad because you miss grandma and grandpa? It feels like such a big deal to see them. I bet you want to give them a hug. It's so hard not to. Helping our children who don't yet have the words name emotions and put words to it is really important. It will help them grow into children as they get older and older who access those feelings and language around feelings a little easier. I just want to say one thing. You didn't traumatize her. <clears throat> what you saw was a normal emotion that's a response to loss of the typical attachment that you have. That was a very normal emotion. You know, if, if, you, if there wasn't love and attachment, you wouldn't have it. So that's just important to know uh, that, that that is so normal and so loving. And, and then you apply some of the things that Teresa said that, that's just so important in terms of, you know, being able to make the space like it's okay to cry. And it's okay to feel these feelings. And of course you're sad. And she's not going to understand it. And so, so, you know, it's very confusing. I understand the, the desire to comfort and you do want to comfort the kids. And on the other hand, how beautiful that she was able to express her emotions just as they were, as raw as they were. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you can do what you can to comfort and also know that the attachment is, is uh, very, very strong. And it's important for her to be able to mourn the loss of the connectedness with her parents, uh, you know, uh, with the connectedness with you. And she mourns it with her parents. They comfort her. And they learn that you're going to come back. She knows you'll come back. And that's important. It'll come, you'll come back on the screen or you come back over the fence again. And soon maybe it could be, you know, in front of the house when she's in, in, the, uh, in the yard or so. 
Um, so that's, that's just a, a beautiful thing for me to hear. Yeah, that's an important point too, to, to remind ourselves and tell our children, this is not going to be forever. It's painful right now. Um, we're doing the best we can and this too shall pass. We have to be patient, we have to be creative, but to just be reassuring in that way, you will see grandma and grandpa again. They will hold you again, right? We don't know when yet, but that will happen. We have a couple more questions. Um, let's, uh, this is a tough one. Uh, All right, you, it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could say it's not my area, but... Uh, do, do you think there are any significant difference? Oh, wait, no, sorry. Let me go back though to the one that was the dog. Any thoughts on dealing um, with elderly with dementia who may not understand the virus and need for social distancing? Oh. Yeah, the, yeah, that's a that's a very very tough one. That's a hard one. Um, you know, I think people have been doing. I've been reading stories about people doing some creative things with elderly parents who are in nursing homes. Oh, does somebody have somebody have a uh, some input? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I'll, un I'll unmute you. Okay. Can there you, you go, me? Great. Thank you. Yes. Okay, hi. I'm hi, Debra. Debra. By the way, um, the only the thought I have is that my daughter works with Alzheimer patients, and she told me, uh, because my dad is also uh, suffering with Alzheimer's, she works with them, and she says that they love to um, be reminded of things that happened in the past. So maybe you, like who's ever dealing with this, you can relate it to something that already happened to them. Like, remember the last time when we had polio and everybody had to stay away from each other? See, I don't know how far along their person is in their um, Alzheimer road, but um, that, that would be a suggestion to just, you know, sort of relate it to something else that's familiar to them. And also the creative idea of, you know, playing the kind of music they like and putting on the kind of shows that they used to watch and uh, maybe getting out. Uh, I'm going to go back to gardening, as I always like to talk about, getting into the yard and, you know, doing things that make them feel useful um, for that time. Because that's what they want to do, feel useful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, like yes. all of us, we all want to feel useful, right? Mm -hmm. just, a, just a little different with them. And, and I think just being clear and, and uh, there's a lot of repeating itself. That just it has to go with the territory and as much as you can in a loving way. Mm -hmm. you know, just know my daughter you always says you have to pretend it's the first time you heard the story. Yeah, that's Even right. if you heard it a hundred times. Yes. Right. right. So yes. they'll repeat and we have to repeat. And it goes both ways. And so that's uh, it's a very tough situation. And again, a very pointed yeah. question. Um, okay, so there's another one that uh, asks, uh, all right, I'm trying to see, move this up a little. Okay, now went all the way down. Let me make this full. That's better. Okay. Um, how do you cope with the gradual opening up and returning to normal daily life if your anxiety is at different levels from the people around you? For example, what if you are very anxious about being out with people, but your partner or family are comfortable and ready for this? Well, you're the family therapist. I have my own individual opinions, and I bet we'll be different on this, so go ahead. Well, I think, you know, I, as I always come back to, it's about having a conversation and people really listening to each other and what e each person's needs are. And if we are, you know, if we're sharing a living space, right, it, with COVID, there's an additional piece of it's, it's not just whether you want to go out in the world and socialize in a way that you feel comfortable and is safe. And I don't, it's if you go do that and you come back into our living space, I may feel that you're putting me at risk. My anxiety might, you know, be higher than yours. So I think families really need to talk about how, what each person needs, what um, they feel is safe or needed for them. We have to look at the information that we're getting from the CDC and we have to come up with something that works for 
us as a unit if we're living together. It may be different if you're not living together. Then it, you may make a decision like, listen, you're dating someone, they're, they're more social, they're out there. We may not see each other then if you're going to engage in this behavior. We may talk through Zoom, we may stay connected, but we may not physically see each other because I don't feel comfortable in, you know, going out and doing um, it, it really depends on a level of, here's where the community piece comes in, commitment to each other and one another's needs as a systems thinker. I think about families and relationships as like very intertwined. There, you know, we can't see one person without looking at the context that they're living in. So my suggestion is be really honest, um, have compassion for the other person's point of view, what their needs are and yours, right? So we don't want to um, discount their fear or anxiety if they're the anxious one. Um, and if they're not, we don't want to um, paint them as a villain who would jeopardize all of us, right? Because the minute we do that, we lose the connection. We want to see how we can problem solve this together and what would be the safest way for us to um, meet our family's needs or our relationship needs. And I do Jody. think, yeah, I just want to say, because we do need to move on. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and these are great questions. So please putting them in there. I'm not saying don't ask questions at all. Um, I think, you know, it also depends on where we are in the pandemic. There, there aren't going to be as many choices as people return to work. Like we're not going to be able to say, we're self-quarantining here and that's what we can do. Like that's not the case anymore. People are going to be out and about. They're returning to work. Um, and so the, the question is, you know, what are you, what are you willing to do in order to uh, use protective gear and that kind of thing? Like masks and gloves were appropriate and, you know, making a commitment like that. But there, there's just no way we're going to be able to, um, you know, fully quarantine uh, uh, unless we're in unique jobs, which, uh, you know, it, it's, it looks like that phase is starting really to decrease and more and more institutions, you know, uh, business firms and, and educational institutions and so on are gradually opening up. So that's yeah. that you have to weigh that and then have that discussion. You know, I, I, either you do have a choice or don't have a choice. Those kinds of things. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I think, you know, Joe and I both work with um, clients who, you know, at times have struggled with um, suicidal thoughts. And one of the things we use are safety contracts where we sit down with them, we, we make a safety plan, figuring out, you know, how they're going to stay safe. And I think families can create safety plans around people going to work. What are you going to commit to in terms of, you know, following these guidelines and protective gear and you know, washing your hands and can we all agree that we're going to do this and can we, you know, commit to creating a document that we together, you know, uh, are going to adhere to in order to protect each other out of love. Mm -hmm. um, so we were just talking about compassionate dialogue really, right? So, you know, when I was talking about seeing the other person's point of view, um, it's really important to have compassion if somebody disagrees with you for where they're struggling, for their pain. Um, and so this slide just really talked about the ability to tolerate our own painful emotions. Being able to do that is the best way to encourage our children and other people in our lives to experience their feelings. You know, we talk about this all the time when we talk about child rearing, modeling behavior, right? You, you want to behave in a way that your children can see and emulate. Same thing comes to how we cope with our emotions, how we experience them and share them. And when we reach out to talk with our children about their feelings, we're actually inviting them to open up a space to allow the pain that's already present in them. They're already in pain because they're not talking about it doesn't mean they're not having all kinds of feelings. So the difference between just a felt experience and verbal expression can be big. You can have kids and many parents will talk to me and say, my kid says nothing. They don't tell me anything. I overhear this or that. You know, sometimes they talk to a friend. Doesn't mean they're not feeling it, right? It means that maybe they're not expressing it. So by really inviting them to talk about something or sharing where, how we're struggling as a means of opening a dialogue, it is creating a space that's, you know, for the pain, for the discomfort they're feeling to be in the room with us, allowing them 
you know, t- to take a risk to talk and share a little bit. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't, I thought I had a slide before this on validation. I wonder if I. Maybe it's uh, after it. Let me just say, yeah, all right, let's do the, this and then we'll go back. So what is validation? In the world of therapy, we talk a lot about validating other people's feelings. Um, so the, the definition here is validation is paying attention to what the other person is saying mindfully listening to him or her and responding in a way that validates the legitimacy of his, her, and I should add their experience because that's a gender binary that we have there. Um, so the legitimacy of their experience. Joe, do you want to say a little bit more about it? Yeah, I think this relates back to the compassion piece that, that no matter what um, the people in our lives are experiencing. So this isn't just children, right? These could be partners and parents and actually friends and so on. Um, you don't have to agree with them, uh, but we do need to see the reality of their experience. In other words, they are exactly where they are. They couldn't be any other place. It may not be where we want them to be, but it's really an important piece in terms of having that felt experience of being understood and being seen. And, and that's the thing that really makes a difference. That's what binds people together and really makes family relationships much more solid. The fact that there's an understanding of why someone is where they are, not that you want them to be there, but that they just are there. And so validating that is so important because we all need to be understood in terms of our individual experiences in this moment and in this pandemic. Oh, let me go back. Right. So what does that look like when we do validation in a conversation, in a relationship? We're going to maintain a non-judgmental stance, right? We're going to be attentive without judgment, which is very hard because I don't know, I'm a parent and I'm fielding a lot of different things. And sometimes when my 20 year old comes to me and complains about something that's stressful for her, I immediately have judgmental thoughts. Like, are you kidding me? (laughs) That's what you're worried about? I just want you to be careful because one of them is on. Oh dear. (laughs) (laughs) I I would say that she already knows. and I have to, I have to take a deep breath before I react to that, right? I have to notice, here we're going back to like checking in with ourselves. I have to notice the thought that I'm having that is really, if I were to say it, pretty invalidating, right? Like, come on, is, is that your biggest problem? That would be so invalidating. So I have to come in in a place of non-judgment. Her experience is her experience, not mine. And she's, she's stressed about it. Let me hear, let me listen to what's going on for her. I want to try to get to a place of understanding what she's saying and reflect it back, um, which means that we can be like a mirror. So it sounds like you're having a really tough time because you're missing your friends. You're missing being able to work on your, your summer class with someone, you know, side by side, doing the homework together and having that bit of social uh, interaction that comes with kind of being in it together when you have schoolwork or stress. And, and you're really kind of sad about it and just frustrated. You want to reflect back what you're hearing um, and you want to hear what they're asking for and what they need. Um, we wa- always want to be curious. We want to, in a conversation where we're validating, um, make sure that we're understanding what the other person's saying. And if we're not sure we're getting it, asking them for more information. Could you say that a little more about that? Like I'm trying to get it. We don't want to fake validation. We want to, we have to be genuine because, you know, especially if you have teenagers, they sniff that out in a minute. We have around five minutes, believe it or not. So I I know we can go a little further, but I just want to uh, say that. And then just the last thing with this, this goes back to the idea really of of having a connection, being compassionate and uh, recognizing that you need to be aware of your own responses, your own emotional um, state, because you're not gonna be able to open up room for somebody else if you're not opening up room for yourself. You gotta open up room for your 
you know, I think the, the uh, analogy of the two-year-old on the other side of the fence is so beautiful, but we need to look at ourselves as that two-year-old too. The two-year-old in us also is scared and, and, you know, we need some help as well. And so I just think that that's an important thing to know if we make room for that in ourselves, we're much more likely to make room for that in others. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the cheat sheet of simple validating responses. Sometimes we don't know what to say to validate. You can just say something simple like, mm -hmm, I know, of course, that makes sense, right? Me too. Or as Joe pointed out to me when we were doing the PowerPoint, just be silent, just be silent and attentive. You can just nod, you know, that when somebody's in pain, that goes a long way. Um, we were going to talk a now bit we're about. We have to move a little quicker with this. Okay. Uh, well, you do, you do go you ahead. Want, do you want to go more to the adapt piece? Um, sure. Only because you know that. How about coping? Yeah, as a teacher, your suggestions are helpful. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Just one of the comments. Um, yeah. So you know, you apply this to the classroom while we're talking about. I don't envy teachers. I, to, oh, I no. never envy teachers anyway. Uh, to, neither Teresa nor I, even though we're, we are part-time professors, we never really had to teach because we have very uh, motivated students. So I, you know, I've never had to motivate a student, but all of you do from K to 12 and even K to whatever, let's say 18. <laughs> but um, it, it's, uh, it's very tough. So for you to create emotionally safe and open spaces uh, is, is a very powerful thing. Please never underestimate your impact. Mm -hmm. So I think, Teresa, maybe you want to go into uh, the, the coping piece because it, it's a, we talk about acceptance mm -hmm. and then, and this idea of healing is coming to terms with things as they are. It's not curing, but it's healing. We can begin to heal when we come to terms with things just as they are. And that's an important thing in terms of being able to um, really live in the confines of a pandemic and also the stress that we have based on our work or our loss of work um, or, so, or actually other people getting sick, obviously. That's, that's mm -hmm. a big issue uh, as well. Yeah, I think, you know, when we, we talked about doing the presentation, one of the things that um, the person who asked us to do this really was focused on was, you know, a lot of teenagers, a lot of um, middle schoolers, little kids too, um, elementary school age, pre-K, pre um, have lost out on important milestones that they were looking forward to, graduating pre-K, which I just found out some places are doing little mini pre-K graduations. Um, uh, high school graduations, college graduations, huge prom, homecoming, those kinds of things. Um, so people are coping with the loss and disappointment. Um, and in some ways, you know, looking for uh, ways to make peace with some of this and have acceptance. And one of the things we can do as parents and a family is really talk to our kids about what is important to us? What is meaningful? What do we value as individuals and families? And for some kids who are big athletes and didn't get to play the big game, you know, that's a huge value that they have being part of a team and being out on the field. And um, we have to really acknowledge that they're not going to have that experience in this moment that they thought they were going to have and that that's difficult. What else do we value? You know, we first have to hear their experience of loss and pain and listen. And we may have to do that repeatedly. This is not one conversation. I wanna make sure we, um, and I think if you're a parent, you already know that. Um, we To process things, to really deal with an emotional experience that's difficult, we have multiple conversations. So part of one or many conversations can be, what else is important? How can we take that energy? How can we take that pain and channel it into something that's meaningful for us that we can do now? That, isn't, that can give us a sense that we are part of a community that we have um, 
lost being able to engage with, right? So sometimes we'll develop in a family a plan that includes living those values in a way in this moment that we can. Um, and so what does that mean? We can create meaningful activities that we do as a family um, or individuals in the family decide they're going to commit to that help us use the time, use the energy and channel it into a place that makes us feel that we are contributing. Uh, contributing goes a long way to healing. So we want to build on existing supports in a family. We need to stay connected to extended family and friends to mm -hmm. still hold that sense that we're not going through this alone or that we have people to turn to. If little kids are, you know, sad about not being able to have their birthday party, Joe has a great story. I think you want to jump in with that. That's really great about yeah. like, you know, a, a kid that had a birthday in the middle of all this. And so <clears throat> this is one of our, our director's granddaughters and she was turning six and she said, uh, you know, they're going to have, they had a little, uh, Kate, she said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to turn six until I have my party with grandma and grandpa. And uh, so she said, don't, please don't tell me I'm six because I'm not going to be six until they get here. <laughs> and what a beautiful thing that is. And so she's not six yet. In that world, she's not six. And that's so wonderful. It's something she really has to look forward to. So it's and no I love that, too, because yeah. kids have so little control. We all are experiencing a loss of control, but they yeah. have so little control. And she was able to make a statement that said, no, not having the birthday. Hmm. Like, that's it. I'm five. And when I can have my party, then, you know, I'm going to take charge of this. <laughs> and uh, and that worked for, yeah. you know, for the time being. Right. Yeah. Um, so we meeting, also, meeting them yeah. where they are, which is really good. Yeah, and we, we also, you know, I, I've heard stories of people, you know, uh, high school uh, prom is a big thing for a lot of high schoolers. If people had bought their gowns, people had, you know, things at the ready. So families can talk about how we might plan in the future when we can get together, having a little celebration where you're going to get dressed up, your friends can connect, maybe you're going to do it out on a football field so there's social distance. And But to start to imagine ways to celebrate that are um, in line with what the kids, the teens are missing are really important because this, it, as I said before, it's not going to last forever and hope for the future. Practicing hope is very important. And by practicing hope, I mean, allowing yourself to feel that there is hope. There is a way having conversations about what might be, what is to come, that's all practicing hope. Uh, and in the meantime, what can we do um, to live our values? We can put energy into volunteer efforts. I know families that have been creating a meal chain, especially when we were at the peak of this epidemic in New York, where they were delivering meals to uh, healthcare workers at the hospital. And a whole community came together and took turns and cooking and who delivered whose day was what. Um, also people in the neighborhood, people have created little neighborhood watches for older adults who are alone to grocery shop for them, drop food off at their doorstep. People are contributing to food banks. So there are a lot of ways that we can sort of say, yeah, it's really rough that we can't have some of these things that we were so looking forward to. And there are also people who really need help and support right now and don't have it. Can we maybe be part of um, a, a chain of help and a chain of caring that um, we can contribute to in the meantime while we're waiting for things to improve? Um, we always also want to put loss and disappointment in context, like look at what is happening in the world, right? This is a moment where we don't have a lot of choices and it wouldn't be safe to have these events happen because we do care about ourselves and our neighbors and we don't want to make things any worse. We can compare, you know, Debbie had talked about with people with Alzheimer's talking about other major events in history that might have been like this. The polio epidemic was the example. Um, talk about what other people have gone through. There were other tough times. And what did we learn from those times? Looking at sacrifice for the greater good. Um, and then there's a little thing that we do in family therapy called the genogram, which is really, when you work with a family, mapping the family over three generations, creating a family tree 
what we look for in therapy are patterns around relationships or illness or mental illness. What we can do with a family resiliency tree is to really try to look at with our kids, what did their grandparents face? You know, they are a generation who's facing something that in the context of the history of this country and the world is going to be something people are learning about for many, many, many years to come. What did grandma and grandpa live through in World War II? Um, what did they have to do in terms of trying to cope with or contribute to make things better. So sometimes if we can show our children this over time, they can align with a hero in their own family rather than some obscure person outside and start to kind of um, live into that spirit. You know, it's a great way to foster combination conversations with extended family and also connections i know that we're probably at time and i and keep... that's okay i listen i just just the last thing and everyone's free to go obviously we won't take attendance but i think um you know one of the ways to actually do this is to um you can develop a storybook or a scrapbook and that's you know what had what was life like you know, before the pandemic and then what changed during it and how did it change even more as it evolved and so on and so forth. Um, and then you really are comparing that that's kind of your pandemic journal um, mm -hmm. that you really are creating a way of looking at how to help families in the future. <clears throat> because th there were, you know, there was, there were previous pandemics. Unfortunately, there are likely to be future pandemics and hopefully not frequently. And the bottom line is that, how do you respond to this kind of challenge? Mm -hmm. and what actually do you find out about yourself in this? What do you find out about your own resilience, your own ability to not only take care of yourself, but to do things well when it wasn't just the right way? And maybe some people have had to work more independently. Some kids have had to be a little more independent in some ways and so on. And that's another way of developing resilience. And some adolescents maybe helped out with meals and doing a little more yard work given everything else that the parents had to do. I mean, so those are the kinds of things that need to be highlighted and honored and um, just really, really very, very important. Yeah, I love the idea of the scrapbook because it, it is a project that a family can do together and everybody can contribute from their own experience. We can cut out newspaper articles. We can take pictures of each other in our masks and <laughs> print those out and put them in. You know, like this is a bit of history in the making. We can exactly. interview our grandparents right. and ha and put their story in what how they're coping what it feels like not to be together this can be something that is done over time and really marks the stages that we've gone through because as we're living it we've also we also have a history with it they're in history yes it yes. is we're living history that's right we are and so when we record it what we're doing is really saying something along the, along the lines of this is our family's place in history and mm -hmm. now we are getting through this in this way. And it's a very, very important thing. So this is the last thing. Yes. It's really, gonna, really important. Yeah. We're going to end on this, right? So, um, you know, as parents, we have a lot of anxiety about how our kids are doing or, you know, how our loved ones are doing. And often, you know, we, we show up to ask them, are you okay? How's it going? Serious conversations. It can't all be heavy. We have got to play together. We have to come up with creative ways, like the scrapbook is fun, but it's also serious. Things that we share together that are just absurdly fun, you know, playing charades through Zoom with other families, you know, with the computer there, you know, on family game night, laughing together, watching a show together, getting outside together. In order to share painful feelings, we have to also share fun because we can't have that kind of level of stress hanging around all the time. We all need to de-stress and play is just as important as work. And we don't as a society honor that, but it is true. So I think we can end on play more so that you can have some balance between some of the difficult stuff and then some of the fun. Thank you. So we did have a question about, um, is this recording going to be posted anywhere? 
And I guess um, that, that's more maybe concerning. somebody from yeah who's do, yeah. on the back end of this could say right. whether um, it is or not. We're currently recording, and it will be posted on YouTube um, in a few days. Oh, okay. oh great. OK. Fantastic. So right. I think we are uh, going to okay. wrap it up. Let me just make sure. Let's see. Everyone is saying, uh, saying thank you in the chat. So I think we're done uh, with the questions. And um, I so appreciate, we both appreciate you coming and being here with us. and. Uh, sharing all of this because everything that you mentioned and you shared um you know stays with us too yeah and it really is very helpful so thank you so much yes thank you for thank joining you. us <laughs> thanks okay bye-bye bye-bye